good morning and welcome everybody. Um, if those that have been uh, participating in our webinars before will probably notice I don't have the laboratory background behind me. I left the lab finally for a few minutes um, doing this webinar from a different location. I'm glad to be here. As, as uh, David had mentioned, I'd spent uh, you know, 25 years in the academic side at, at Georgia and Arkansas and Colorado State. And in that time, um, I was more in an extension role. So I wasn't just stuck in a classroom teaching all the time. I did do some teaching, but primary role was working with the industry and troubleshooting um, some of the industry issues they have. So some of what I'm presenting is what we've seen back then when I was um, in that position, then also uh, currently in the last three years, I've been with James Way, um, you know, doing kind of the same thing, but but for more, a, uh, definitely more of a applied side as I'm now with an incubator company rather than working more with integrator, integrators. So um, egg pack, talking about the egg pack. First of all, let's just go back and look at what we all know to believe is the basics of incubation. You know, there's four basics of incubation, and I, and I think this is, is not debatable. We all see this. I've seen this in a, tons of presentations. I've used it. We have temperature, we have humidity, we have ventilation. Um, let me get a little pointer here. I tend to point at things. We have ventilation, we have turning. All incubator companies do the same things. We all try to control these um, parameters. Um, with whatever system we have. This is our control panel and our single stage machines and we can control a lot of things to try and get that exact temperature. Um, however, what we want to um, remember is these are the basics of incubation, but what are we actually missing? What is not included in here? Probably the most important factor of incubation and being a successful hatchery is the egg. We have to have the egg good eggs. We can have all the other equipment, but the egg is important. The other thing to remember is we cannot turn a bad egg into a good egg. Cannot do it. You know, heard for years and, and it's kind of a joke when it's, when it's said, but it is true. We cannot hatch an infertile egg. We also, if we're get, given a poor quality egg from some other parameters, it makes it difficult to hatch as well. This is the fuel. Um, this, this is the, one of the most important things for our hatchery that will allow us to have the possibility of a running a good successful hatchery. The hatching potential of an egg is determined at over position, the time it is laid. Um, as that poten the potential is there, we cannot improve the hatchability of an egg after it's laid. But we can reduce its hatching potential after lay by how we handle and, and care for those eggs. Sometimes the eggs we get from the hatchery, not only or they have a, a, a fixed hatchability, hatching potential. There are items that can happen in the house or from the house to the hatchery that can have an effect on that as well. We hear people talk about things to do to improve hatchability. True, we can do things to improve hatchability in our hatcheries, but we cannot improve hatchability of a single egg from what it was when it was laid. And I think the other thing um, well, when we talk about egg pack, just kind of a clarification is egg pack is bas basically the hatching egg quality. I've used this term egg pack previously in, in years past where we're really just looking at um, the cleanliness, the, the egg shape, the, um, you know, the shell quality, things like that, as far as our um, egg pack and what is brought into the hatchery. But really the first thing there is fertility. I mean, that's again, the most important thing. I bring this up because we go to a lot of hatcheries and you know that is one of the issues they deal with. And there's not anything we can do it about that in the hatchery, but that's where we really need to get into working with our, our breeder departments. Um, if we're trying to win at anything, if we're trying to win a race, what do we need? We need the best car or the hatchery equipment, a great driver, that will be the manager, the personnel, the maintenance, and the best fuel, eggs. We need all of those to maximize the potential. Can we hatch eggs if we don't have the best equipment, the best manager personnel, and the best eggs? Sure, we can hatch some, but we're not going to be maximizing our potential. We're not going to be um, as efficient as we can be. And, and really, the, what we're trying to do is produce as many quality chicks as possible. So we can hatch some without these three parameters being the best they can be, but we're going to be limited in what we can do. I gave a presentation um, 
a while back to um, uh, one of our customer um, uh, remote customer programs we do, and we, we do these. And if any of you are interested, we'll be glad to put one of these together as well. But they were wanting to know what makes a successful hatchery. So without getting too much into the nuts and bolts of a hatchery, I just kind of put together you know, these things. And I'm not going to talk about all these, but at the top of the list, when I put this together was an excellent breeder program and hatch and egg management. Those are two things that happen before we ever stick an egg in an incubator. And that is really, and that's where I'm going to be talking about, but is really um, of utmost importance. Cannot hatch an infertile egg ever, as I mentioned. Can't do it. When fertility drops, embryo mortality will increase. And I'm going to talk about that just a little bit, but we need to remember that. When fertility drops, we not only lose the number of fertile eggs, the embryo mortality of those fertile eggs will also increase, and I'll, and I'll kind of explain that. So we will have with for, reduced fertility, we have drops in hatchability, lower percent hatch of fertile, reduced chick quality, poor broiler performance. I've done a number of research over time to show that when we have fertility drops, we not only lose just those eggs, we lose hatch fertile, we lose chick quality, we lose broiler performance um, as far as seven day and 14 day livability of those broilers. Um, when that fertility drops, those that are fertile have a propensity for some of these other uh, issues. Bottom line is on this, before I get into the rest of the program, you can have a great breeder program and a bad hatchery, but you cannot have a bad breeder program and a great hatchery. It's just not going to happen. And, and I've been in hatcheries before and, and where they had some pretty severe fertility problems. And, but they still want the chicks. They still want the hatch of fertile they're expecting. Well, we do have of the fertility, we want that same hatch of fertile. You're not going to get it. Every hatchery I've seen that has been running at full speed and the top of the game has a great breeder, breeder program right ahead of it. So as hatchery managers, Again, it's almost like the, the hatching potential of an egg is set. All we can do is try and maintain that, but we can improve the hatch, hatching potential, but we can do a lot of things to make it worse. It's the same thing with the whole breeder program. You know, if you've got um, great eggs coming in, you can run a bad hatchery, but you can do everything you're supposed to do in your hatchery as far as maintaining equipment, management, and whatnot, but if you have a bad breeder, breeder program, you're limited in what you can do. So they have to go together. And, and I just cannot emphasize that enough um, because we've seen this issue come up to where, um, you know, people want the best results, but you gotta know that you're, you're, there's limitations when we don't have that breeder program behind it. So let's look at the hatching eggs themselves and, and talking about the, the fertilization process. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about this. I have a number of times but the fertilization process starts with insemination, either artificial or natural, and moves through the hen until we get fertilization. This function right here, sperm storage, we'll talk a little bit about that and not so much about the others. Um, but we have fertilization that's occurring um, in that hen um, at the time of lay. When that sperm comes in contact with the, um, the yolk, um, the gunner goes an acrosome reaction. And I mentioned this because I'm gonna, I'm gonna just talk about this very briefly later, but the sperm actually digests a hole in that membrane to gain access to the genetic material to fertilize the egg. Where does this occur? It occurs right up in the, the upper regions of the infundibulum or the oviduct in the infundibulum. And within minutes, um, we have fertilization, literally within minutes, less than five minutes. Some of the literature will say more, but less than five minutes. Um, fertilization occurs as soon as albumin start put on that egg, then there's an inhibitor there, prevents any other fertilization. And there's kind of reasons for that, but we just need to know that. And then the egg, of course, is transported down the oviduct as the um, contents of the egg are formed, the, the albumin, the membrane, the shell, everything. And, and the 24 to 26 hours to complete that at a body temperature of 104 to 105 Fahrenheit or 40, 41 Celsius. Um, that's all obviously sufficient to start that embryo growth. So when that 
egg is laid, a laid egg represents one day's embryonic growth. Uh, it could be up to 60,000 cells, 20, 40, 60,000 cells. Part of that depends on how quickly they're picked up by the house and the ambient conditions and everything. But so we do have some, some substantial growth in that um, egg at the time that it is laid. And this is why we can see the, the often see the difference in unincubated eggs. A fertile egg, we see this donut shape that represents the cellular division that's starting to occur. In fertile egg, we see this tight, compact um, germinal disc area because we don't really have that cellular division. It's, it's as it was laid and there was no fertilization, so no initiation of growth or development. I mentioned a little bit about the sperm, still, sperm cell storage within the hen. And, and the reason why I mention this is, is there's, um, there, there's a, that, that goes into our reduced fertility and our, and our poor uh, livability and our embryo viability. In the hand, they have these storage scripts right here um, at the uterus, uterovaginal region. Um, these scripts on the oviduct are basically just um, folds. And so when a male seminates a female, sperm goes into those scripts and is stored. And as long as she's laying, and as long as she keeps being um, fertilized, the egg passes, sperm is released, the rooster come and mates her again, and sperm goes back in the top of that oviduct. So when an egg passes the next day, the last sperm in from the day before is the first sperm back out to fertilize that egg. So what happens when um, the, the birds are not mated every two to three days? We can get good fertility, sometimes with uh, fertilization once a week, maybe twice a week. But what happens when we start going two weeks between mating in our older flocks, our flocks that have males that we've lost body weight on? Um, uh, maybe their hens are slatted. They don't want to get around the males. So all these conditions where we've got too few males will cause reduced fertility, reduced mating activity. When that happens, then the hen starts utilizing the sperm that's down at the bottom of these crypts. And, and there's a, a paper from years ago called old stale sperm, old stale sperm. And when the hens has to start using that old stale sperm, we may get fertility, but we don't necessarily have a embryo that's as viable. Um, real briefly, one of the things I did when I was um, this many years ago at university developed a technique that we can actually count this activity of each of these of sperm activity on the membrane. This is the membrane that's been stained over the yolk. This is the germinal disc, and each of these little white dots represents where a sperm has bound and attached and digested away into that um, the brain access to the female uh, genetic material. So we we're able to use this to kind of in some research settings and also so there's some field application for it as well. But in a research setting, we were able to really look at what was happening um, with birds when they, um, you know, have situations of infrequent mating. And this, this was one of the trials we did. And again, this is just kind of um, uh, show what, um, or ex further explain what we're seeing is in hens that when we have infrequent mating. So we inseminate hens with a 200, 150 million sperm, three different doses. We actually had less than this, um, but we believe um, from research that in a natural mating condition, rooster will inseminate between 100 and 200 million sperm um, each time he, he mates with the female. And then this would be days after that insemination and these are the sperm numbers. So remember in the previous slide, we saw all those little white dots and holes when we get out, say here, when there's 100 million sperm, when we get out past a week, we start getting, you know, less than 10, down to seven, down to five. We start getting fewer and fewer sperm there. What this is telling us that hen is starting to pull sperm out of that bottom of that storage, sperm storage tubule, the storage crypts. So we can get fertility here, but only takes one sperm. But when we start seeing these lower numbers, we know there's infrequent mating going on. So we've actually looked at some commercial flocks out in the field where we've known some of the conditions the flock are under and, and kind of back this up. So we know that there's, there's less mating activity. So there's less sperm there. Those sperm are sperm that have been stored. When we follow this same scenario um, with uh, the different semination doses and looked at fertility, you know, like I said, we get about seven to eight days and our fertility you know, hangs up there and then we start in this pretty big drop after a week between matings. 
I mean, if they're less sperm inseminated, obviously it drops off quicker. <clears throat> but we'll look at these two up here. When we get out past eight days and we see this fertility start to drop, this red line here represents the percentage of the embryos um, that we have that were die in early death in the first three days. So percentage of the fertile eggs. So when we get out here about 12 days, we're looking at 10 to 15% of the eggs that are fertile are gonna die in the first three days. Because now we're looking at that weakened sperm, the, we have a less viable embryo. The longer we go between matings, the higher that number climbs to where we have, uh, when you get out beyond two weeks, we're getting upwards of 50%, half the fertile eggs that you put in your machines are gonna die in the first three days. It's a weakened embryo. So this is what I say, when we see a drop in fertility, most of our fertility problems that I've seen in breeders in my you know, 25 plus years um, experience out work, and I've worked on the breeder side and the hatchery side both, I would say 90 plus percent of our fertility problems are due to infrequent mating. You know, one of the parameters I said, few, too few males, uh, the males are uh, physically incapable of being as active as they used to be, be even very physically um, uh, um, adept males lose libido. They don't want to mate as often. So particularly in our older flocks, we will see fertility drop and we'll see early embryo mortality climb. This can also happen in flocks that aren't old, if the hens are slatted, if they're um, too few males. So we will see that. So when I have people say, well, why can't we get that hatch of fertile? If we have fertility, why can't we get the hatch of fertile of those eggs anyway? What's well, not going to happen? I mean, this is this nothing's done to these. This is a biological um, happening that's beyond our control when we the hens have to start using this older sperm. So when we look at this line that I had up here, uh, this is a fertility line of a collective group. But at some point in here, you know, we're looking at a single egg. You could have a single egg all of a sudden that egg is less, is not fertile, this egg is not fertile, and that's why we see that drop. We have fewer and fewer fertile, um, and, but at some point it's like with a hen, it's like she lays fertile eggs and then day 13, nope, not. She might lay fertile egg 14 after that, she's done. So we drop, so we're looking at a single egg thing that each egg then is um, subjected to this older stale sperm, so that's where we start seeing some of these changes. So when I look at, look at that and look at some other parameters on that, this in vivo sperm storage refers to the length of time in vivo means in body. So the length of time the hen had to store sperm. Um, when we're within five days, so the, hen, the hens are mated every five days, um, we look at our hatch and this hatch numbers are low. And we would typically do this in research settings. We would inseminate lower doses because we want to see the difference, you know, there's no sense putting four times as many sperm in there as that's necessary. So in first five days, we would see a hatch of 66%, hatch of fertile of 78 again. That's kind of low, but we used a low um, dosage of sperm. But we can see what happens six to 10 days. And then even after 10 days, our hatch is down to 24% with a hatch of fertile. We've lost 11 to 12% hatch of fertile. So of the fertile eggs, we're still not getting um, the hatch when our mating activity is reduced, but then tie that into not just embryos. And I, that's, that's not the point of this talk, but we have um, a, a system where I believe at one time we thought our grow out is six weeks or eight weeks, depending on your market um, you're shooting for, of our broilers. Well, it's actually, we got to add count the three weeks of the incubation time in chickens, four weeks in turkeys. And now we need to look at, okay, the egg storage time and, and, and mating frequency time. And that will actually even affect um, put out the broiler side. We saw that here when we had infrequent mating. So we had, um, this is a body weight. Um, the chicks were smaller at hatch. They were smaller at seven days. They were smaller at 14 days. Um, and then we had a, a fairly high, we repeated this and it wasn't quite this high, but we always had more percent dead in that time as well. Um, and most of that occurred early. We had just, uh, like I said, a, a weakened embryo, a weakened sperm, weakened embryo, we have a weakened chick. So one of the reasons why that breeder farm is so important, not only for our hatch and hatch of fertile in our chicks, but also for our broiler performance um, out in the field. So 
um, looking just to kind of follow up in, in their natural conditions where, why we say that infrequent mating can have such an effect. This is what we would see in a normal flock, good flock peat production. When we're counting those little holes I showed you, um, and not going into detail on that, we would have 60 to 70 percent or more would have well over 100 holes, and that's what we'd see in a normal good flock with high fertility. What about our young and old ones? So look at our young, the red bars here is our young flocks. So we still see a good percentage of them, 15 percent, we have 11, 30, over 20 percent of them had, you know, 15, 20. These also are going to experience um, some early embryo mortality. Um, and these young flocks are still learning how to, how to mate and, and all that. And so we don't have mating frequency as often. So we typically see higher embryo mortality in our young flocks. And look at our old flocks. Um, mating frequency has really dropped off. We would see over 40% in, this, in some of the flocks we looked at that have those single digit numbers, meaning that 40% of the eggs laid, they have probably have not been mated in the last two weeks. So we're gonna have embryo mortality low fertility and embryo mortality. Okay, and then, then if we have infrequent mating, we can see um, we have an average flock with infrequent mating, we actually will see these numbers drop. So they're not, not mating, but they're mating less frequently. And so with this one here would have poorer males, this would be a less a mating activity, infrequent mating. So we still see that 20%. This one here would be um, indicative of a male quality, male physiology, poor sperm quality in that males. So we don't have these higher numbers, but we still have low number here because that activity is going on. So infrequent mating is going to affect our fertility and our hatchability and our hatch fertile and our chick quality and all that. So fertility, we have to have excellent fertility to get the hatch results. Um, and then egg handling beyond that. Now we're going to talk about the eggs themselves. And once we get to the eggs and how to handle those eggs and which eggs should be set at the farm. Um, the whole egg handling issue starts at the farm and continues clear until the eggs are set in the incubator. So the purpose of storing hatching eggs, um, as we all know, is, is really a couple things. One, we're trying to get a collective number of eggs to fill our machines. Um, most of our industry, I think, is like we have X number of machines, we need to fill them today. When we look at um, some primary breeders and some other specialty um, uh, fields, pheasants and, and game birds and stuff where they have a set amount that they have to produce each week from certain lines, they might have to store them a little bit longer. So we store eggs to preserve that hatchability until we can get them in the incubators. And in that time, we're trying to, um, you know, arrest embryo development while preserving the integrity of the egg contents, yolk, albumin, et cetera. Um, a lot of talks on that, won't get into that. And really the physiological zero is what we're trying to get to the point to where we're not getting additional growth. And we did some work years ago to look in our situation because there was the numbers ranged a pretty big range of what physiological zero was. So we took eggs out of a hen house and we put them in various temperatures, um, 75 Fahrenheit, 80, 85, 90, and we'd store them for four days. And we were looking using a dissecting microscope to look at the, the diameter, the, the growth of that germal disc embryo development on a large number of eggs. And so when we had them at 75, even after four days, we just saw no growth, no change in that germal disc. At 80 degrees, yes, we started seeing some growth. And obviously at 85 and 90, this is about 23 to um, Celsius, 23 and a half Celsius. So, you know, from that standpoint of preserving the embryo and trying to arrest that development, 75 degrees was our physiological zero. It needs to be below that. We often store eggs much cooler than that. That's where we get into preserving the integrity of the other yolk contents, the, the yolk and albumin and, and everything, and trying to maintain that. The longer we store eggs, obviously, the cooler we're going to have to store them. But um, that's the temperature that we wanted to get below to, for that embryo itself to kind of um, keep all our embryos in a, in a tight uniform package so we don't have too much pre-incubation and keep our hatch window narrow. So looking at um, what we talk about as far as our egg handling and our, and our, hat, our the, egg, the exposure our eggs have to um, environmental conditions, ideally we should have um, two temperature changes. At the, hen, the hen's body, it's gonna be about 104, 105, six degrees. 104, 106. 
the hen house then, obviously once they're laid, they're gonna start cooling to the temperature of the hen house. Then they're gonna cool again as they're moved into the on-farm egg room. And then the transportation trucks, we recommend having that a couple of degrees cooler than your egg room. And then as they move from the truck to the hatching egg storage room in your hatchery, we recommend that being a couple of degrees cooler. The range in here is not like, well, keep your egg room as long as it fluctuates between 66 and 70 Fahrenheit, you're good. No, you know, pick one and have it say, we might say 70 degrees on farm egg room, 68 for our egg trucks, 66 for the egg room. Reason why I like that number decreasing is, and I'm pretty confident in saying this, I just don't see people being able to keep an on-farm egg room, a truck, and a hatchery egg room, the same temperature, the exact same temperature. So as long as we have that pattern, we're cooling, 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 and then they get in that egg room. And then once we uh, move them to preheating area, um, whether that be in the machines uh, or whatnot, they need to be start warming. They need to stay in that direction. This is different if we're doing long-term egg storage where we want to manage a control, some controlled bumps in temperature for different reasons under normal conditions. This is um, the scenario we want to have here. And when we start having these bounces here, when we have leaks in our on-farm egg room, when we have um, poor egg uh, delivery trucks, the temperature is not controlled. When we have people leave eggs in, in the house all afternoon, all night to the next day when we have severe temperature changes, that's where we start getting these bounces and then we'll start getting some embryo mortality. And we did a study um, one time where we looked at a couple of different studies where we um, created either two, in one case of two, another case of four degree um, temperature uh, variants from a set point of 70, say we had some at 74 and 66 and had eggs bounce in that. And when we looked at that, we were seeing between these two studies, anywhere from three, three and a half to just over 2% loss in hatch just during the egg storage on the farm. Or you could say from the farm to the truck to the hatchery, but either way, we were creating those bounces in, um, in temperatures. And we, we wanna avoid that. We wanna have two temperature changes, cooling and then warming. What about our actual coal eggs? How much of do an impact do they have? And I, and I know this is a point of discussion as far as what eggs should be sent to the hatchery. Um, you know, I, I had discussion years ago with somebody and they said, well, if you don't put them in the incubator, you have 0% percent chance of them hatching. True, good point. You'll have a 0% chance of them hatching. However, there are situations in here where you could be damaging your other eggs in your, um, in your incubators if we do things that create contamination issues due to breakage or, or whatever. So this collective group of eggs here, we see some few eggs in here that might be good eggs. A lot of them we probably wouldn't use, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, our coal eggs, shell quality and our dirty eggs and a little just briefly about a little trial we did with those and show you some data. What about upside down eggs? Another thing we looked at was egg weight, egg shape, egg color. These things here were brought up numerous times by people a few years ago is like, what's happening with our egg weight? It's all over the board, you know, within a flock. What about the shape? We're seeing the football shaped eggs and the golf ball shaped eggs. You know, is that changing? What are we seeing and how does that affect hatch? And then egg color, this came up again very recently. How much is that color affecting if we have too much variation within a buggy of eggs um, from your light to your darks, does that affect our hatch? So talk a little bit about some of those things. First on the broken eggs, and I have to do a little clarification here of what a broken egg is. Some eggs are obviously broken. They're leaking contents out of that egg. You can actually see into that egg. Um, some fractures are not noticeable. Um, when we candle eggs, we'll often see these little lines here. Sometimes we see a little spider spider line that there was obviously a break at some point. Um, you know, this, this is what we might see as well. And, and I want to differentiate between these two because, you know, we, we did a study and I'll show you the data in a little bit where we created this broken eggs, but the kind that you can't really see that only show up in this candling later to where we cause these breaks put them in an incubator and, and pull them out. That's a different broken egg. If we don't have a change in the integrity of that shell, um, we only lost about, we lost about 5% hatch of those eggs that had these very minor cracks that did not go through the membrane, did not 
break the shell. So you can put a fingernail on it, scratch that shell, and you don't feel anything. Yet three days later, after candling, you see this little line. Um, we set those eggs. You know, they're not leaking. They, they've got a little, you might have a little uh, more moisture loss, but in our situation, we had 5% less hatch. So if we were had an 85% hatch, we would still get 80% of the eggs hatched that had these little micro cracks that were really did not disrupt the integrity of the shell. This one here, probably if we looked at it and could scrape our finger on it, would probably feel the shell itself, the integrity broken. And then those are the kind we wanna get out of because they, then we've lost a lot of the protective barrier. So um, just a little difference in that when I show you some of that data, <clears throat> some of these are very small fractures that are not noticeable unless we candle them. And, and those things are not as bad as we think they are. Um, call eggs, slab-sided eggs, long, narrow, wrinkled, calcium deposits, misshaped, too small eggs. <clears throat> One thing I will say about these, these call eggs, and, I, and I, I don't even have this in our data, um, when I was doing those studies looking at, at the sperm penetration values in there, I can take a dirty floor egg, a, an egg with a toe punch in it, um, you know, even an egg that's a week old or more, um, good, clean, whatever. And I'm going to see those sperm penetration numbers the same. So fertility doesn't really change. One thing about these eggs, when we start seeing eggs that are coming out slab, not as much slab sided, but wrinkled deposits, misshaped, um, we're getting about half the sperm activity in there, meaning the hen has got something wrong with her. More often than not, she's got something wrong with her. She's not being mated. She's not able to store sperm. So um, those definitely need to go out for a number of reasons. One, we could have more cracks um, and more possibility of contamination and leakage in the hatchery. But two, your fertility is re dramatically reduced in these eggs because of the hens themselves um, are, are subpar and have some other um, physiological problems usually that are causing those eggs. Um, what about dirty eggs? You know, these are some pretty dirty eggs. We'll talk about dirty eggs, either fecal material or um, litter material stuck on them, nesting material, sometimes blood. Um, one thing when we did this trial, we weren't really trying to say, okay, how do we fix it? We're saying, what are the damages that can occur when people try to fix it? So we, you know, implemented, had a bunch of students do this and say, okay, we want you to take some of these dirty eggs and pretend like you're the producer that wants to make them all look like nice hatching eggs and sand them and use the same sanding block all day and or get a wet wipe and wipe the eggs off and use the same rag all day long because that's often what's really going to happen. And then we set those eggs to see how, how what effect it had on hatchability. So um, hopefully you can see on this, but when we had our coal eggs, of course, our percent hatch loss was nearly 50%. Like I said, a lot of that is just plain fertility. Those broken eggs with micro cracks that are, does not damage the integrity of the shell. They're not leakers. Um, we don't see indentations. We can't feel the change in that shell. Like I said, a 5% loss was all we had uh, in those. So we had a company that was very, very uh, stringently going through their eggs and candling and removing anything that they saw those little lines on. And I was looking, I'm like, most of those, there's, there's no change in the integrity of that shell. But when you candle them, you see that little line there. So that membrane allowed some fluid up in there that changes that color, but the shell itself is still intact. I go 5% less hatch on those. If you have 1%, one and a half percent of those eggs, it's too many. But if you start setting those eggs, that's a lot more chicks. You still need to address the cracks, but don't throw them all out because they can still hatch for you. And in this particular company, they were able to get quite a few more chicks out of the hatchery with a very small loss in hatchability because there wasn't a huge number of eggs. So those broken eggs without the loss of integrity of that shell, a very little change in hatch. Of course, adult coal eggs, big change, um, nearly 50%. Those dirty eggs, about 20% loss in hatch. And when we tried to make those look like clean eggs, um, it, it didn't, it didn't have, had no effect. Essentially had no effect at all. We still had the same loss in hatch. So we may have, Growers are getting paid more for the hatching eggs, which is normally the way it works. Um, and when, they, when they're doing that and send them into the hatchery, um, not only are we going to have hatch loss, but we're going to have some contamination issues. And I'm not sure whether that slide's still in here or not. But um, they, essentially, um, what we had is we still had um, 
the same contamination often more when we tried to fix the eggs and make them look good than we did when we just left them dirty. So, uh, you know, we generally have some recommendations and I'll talk about those in a little bit of how to handle that in the dirty eggs. Upside down eggs. Now this, this is a, is a, a different, there's some clarifications that have to be made here. When we set eggs upside down, coming in and we just said, okay, let's just set some upside down. No ANOVO vaccination. You know, we had a lot fewer, we had less loss in our hatch than a lot of people report. We were having, you know, 12%, 13% loss in hatch from those set upside down. You know, some of those can hatch upside down. Some of those are still oriented correctly because of the, the embryo, the egg itself might look kind of like a football. But when we add the ANOVO ejection, then this number will dramatically increase up to half um, of the chicks or more are not gonna hatch when they're upside down. We're doing a residue breakup not too long ago. And we saw a lot, we, we were looking at, okay, in, in each um, basket of eggs, um, we averaged over one, you know, sometimes two or three upside down in the same one that, that didn't hatch. Um, but you figure, it says if you've got one to two, if you have two, upside down eggs in each rack, I said, that's, that's a percent loss. That's one less chick per basket. You know, that's a big number. Um, sometimes it is hard to determine what's right end is up. Sometimes it's just lazy. I think in the years I've been doing this more often than not, when I noticed one was upside down, I look at it and go, yeah, that's wrong. I could tell right away, but you know, with the experience you can get there. Sometimes it's just being people being lazy and not really looking. That can be an issue tracking that um, you know, not just lost, but how many of them were set upside down, not just oriented, but set upside down. One of the other things we looked at um, was a variation in the color of the eggs. And this came out um, as we started seeing, particularly in some breed strains at the time. Um, and even now we'd see more of the darker and lighter ones. And so, you know, instead of just kind of looking at the eggs, yeah, these look more variable than those. And, and we did this because a, a couple of hatcheries were telling us they thought their hatch was off because of variation in egg color. So when we looked at this and looked at thousands of eggs, we had a colorimeter, gave us a score. We can look at a normal distribution within a flock. Yes, you have some on each range, darker and lighter. Well, what did this actually do to hatch? Well, what we would expect. <laughs> the, the normal hatch rate here, the egg score, we had a lot more eggs here, but this is our hatchability. Our hatchability did not change until we got out here. What are these eggs out here? They're the really white, chalky looking eggs that we all know we're not supposed to set. When we're within a normal range of we've got some darks, we've got some lights, we wouldn't call them white, but we have some darks and lights, we didn't see a difference in hatch across that. So our answer was, yes, there's a difference there. Is that the reason they're getting less hatch? Probably not unless they're setting a lot of these real white eggs. That can kind of be the, the um, color of eggs can be correlated to some extent, not exactly with our specific gravity. So we kind of tie these two together as well. Um, and the way we do um, specific gravity, there's a couple of different methods, but um, we use the salt water, salt bath method and um, where we're floating eggs and trying to categorize them into ranges of 1.06 to 1.09 um, usually you do it in increments of 0 0.005 and I can get you information on this if you're interested and I think it's a good thing to do periodically just to look at your um, shell quality. Um, but that is an indicator of eggshell strength. It's an indicator of eggshell strength. It's not an exact, but it does give you some measures that, that may um, be helpful and beneficial. So what do we typically see with that is this, this would be our um, range we're trying to keep our eggs, what we see in that specific gravity here, what we see is, is that the lower the specific gravity number, the lighter the eggshell color. The higher the number, we typically have a darker egg. Now, can you take one egg out and look at it and go, oh, based on its number, it's a 1.085? No. But if you do flock after flock of eggs and you do specific gravity and you have them in your tanks and you pull all of them out that floated here and all that floated here and all that floated here and you look across the board you will go from typically the lighter eggs would float here the darker eggs will float here um, so 
it's a measure of that, but it's not exact. Um, but we do see some correlations with it. Um, the, the pigment color is largely genetic based. Now, um, you know, a chicken's going to put brown pigment on an egg. So her genetics is going to tell her how much. We have some breeds of chicken that will have lay a darker pigment in egg than others, obviously. But within a collective group, you will have the same hen that will consistently lay a darker egg. And you'll have another hen, same breed strain, raised the same, that's going to consistently lay a lighter egg. And that consistency is going to carry through. So as they age, we have typically have thinner shells. So the ones that were laying a little bit lighter egg at peak production are going to get lighter as we have less shell there. If we have less shell, we have less pigment in the shell. Those that were laying a really dark egg initially, those eggs will get a little bit lighter, but the shell quality is still going to be reduced. That's why we have, we, it's not exact because there's some other variables in there as well, but it, it can be an indicator um, of your shell quality. Not exact. When we looked at our hatch based on specific gravity, we actually saw in our study, and this is where we typically want to be in this 1.08, we didn't see a big difference clear down here into 1.07. I, I still say we should be up here in our hatch. We're going to get the best hatch. But when we get these um, low specific gravity, poor shell quality, really light eggs is when we start seeing that drop in hatch. Um, it can happen on the other end too with a really thick shell. And, and I've been asked that before, should we be concerned with too good of shells? Well, I, I never say we have a too good of a shell because it's only gonna get worse as the hens age. But it's just something to think and, and consider. What about the shell modeling or windows? And this was another, another thing we did. These little spots, these little modeling spots, you know, what causes that? You know, but, oh, it's shell quality. It's, they're, they're no good, you need to throw them all out. Well, these will go, coincide very closely with those shells that have those little micro cracks we can see under candling. If we can't feel a change in, in the integrity of the shell, these will follow that same line there. The, what causes this is a slight separation of that membrane and the shell where you get some moisture between that membrane and the shell causes, causes a little bit of discoloration here. Um, doesn't necessarily affect our hatch. Um, can slightly affect our moisture loss potentially, but when we did our hatch um, comparison of these shell modeling or windows and not, we did not see a significant difference in hatch between these. Again, shell quality maintains the same. These little windows are not gonna, uh, I will say they're not the reason you might not be hatching. Uh, I'll put it that way. I mean, do they hatch a little worse? Uh, it was debatable. We didn't see it significantly in ours. What about the, the other variations in eggs? We have size, shape, shell quality. Um, when we looked at egg weight, um, there's a couple things we need to remember. There's a great variation in egg weight, greater weight, greater variation in egg weight than there is in the length of the width. So often they kind of um, stay that same length or width, but just get bigger as they get older. We don't really see the same hens also laying a wider egg or a longer egg. They typically just get bigger as they get older. Um, Small hens tend to lay smaller eggs and vice versa. Um, so if you've got small birds um, for the life of a flock, you're probably going to get smaller eggs. On the flip side, if you don't control your body weight in your hens, you, you'll get bigger eggs. We're having a, a number of discussions lately on what to do about these excessively large eggs in some of our egg flats. Um, I think all incubator companies will have that same concern some of these big eggs don't fit in these flats. And so we're faced with how to deal with that. And, and the, the root of that is, is if we need to control our breeder hens, our breeder hen weight, body conformation and size through um, feeding programs, diet and, and, and whatnot to kind of control that egg size early on because they will get bigger as they age. Now, if we have our force for one reason or another to keep hens you know, 70, 75, 80 weeks, or even molt, which I've seen in, on a few occasions, but I have seen it, we're going to have big eggs. We're going to have bigger eggs anyway, but we need to control that. Small eggs, all hens, see smaller legs, and flip side bigger hens typically will lay those bigger eggs. And they can't, the bigger eggs can be a problem. Uh, more pro prolific layers tend to lay smaller eggs because they're constantly have a bigger demand on their body to produce an eggshell and eggshell contents. Older flocks, they lay fewer eggs. Um, hens with shorter collection lengths or sequences tend to lay larger eggs. That's those that lay fewer eggs have short clutch lengths. 
So they lay four eggs in a row and skip a day, four eggs in a row and skip a day. You know, one that's laying at 90% is gonna lay an egg nine days in a row and skip a day. So when we start having shorter collect lengths, we have less prolific layers, um, then we, we typically will see a change in egg size as well. Um, and as the hens age, that size will increase. Um, and eggs laid in the morning typically are a little bit larger. And what about the shape? The shape is determined by a couple of things. This is partially genetic, um, but there are some things. The amount of albumin secreted in that albumin secreting region. So if there are some dietary changes, uh, lack of water availability or, or problems with that water, um, they may be creating a little bit of uh, uh, their albumin secretion and uptake in that egg, if that's altered, it could change that shape. Size of the lumen, part of the isthmus down here, um, if we get um, a, a very tight, compact, like smaller or younger hens have a, have a tighter oviduct and they smaller eggs as they get bigger, more room in there, we get a loose, because really there's a containment there and you're forming an egg inside of something with barriers and walls and that lumen, the outer wall of the oviduct is that. Muscular activity, the walls can change that, and then the alterations in the uterus due to damage or other things can change the shape. Um, but it's largely um, genetic. So shape, more variable in length or width, but not weight. And I'm going to talk about some of these um, things as well. Um, there's genetic influences, but um, we're, we're talking about within um, birds that we have. So when we started looking at this egg size and, and stuff, it, wanting to know, is that really a problem or is it just people saying it appears? And I think for egg size, um, we see in flats, sometimes we say these got a big difference in egg weight, not necessarily. It's the shape that determines some of these height changes. Um, but egg size, like I said, is largely a factor of um, keeping older birds. Look at... Um, and keeping bird, getting birds overweight. But look at this over um, weeks of age and we looked at our CV value. When we started doing this, we had somebody tell us that they go, oh, you're not gonna see you know, anything over uh, the CV value over five to 8%. And we saw a few, but they were, they were about right. But it really didn't see a big change. We saw a bigger range in egg weights early on as they're coming into production, which makes sense. Um, their, their reproductive systems are not and completely in sync. And then as they get older, we saw another um, place where we saw a little bit of better CV value. So it, you have hens that are still laying or not at all. So we have a little bit tighter control over the size, less variation, but right in the middle here, it just kind of stays the same. Um, what did that do with our hatch? This was a very crude study. We just took a normal group of eggs coming into, into the hatchery, um, nothing unique about them, but we just weighed them all split them up into the top third middle and bottom third by weight and then looked at our um, hatch and although there's numerical differences here um, we would see similarities when we did this trial at other times we'll see the same similar trends but um, with the, the range we had we never showed anything significant bottom line was is that those eggs that were sent to the hatchery underwent their normal egg pack selection criteria um, we didn't see a big difference from the smallest to the lot to the, the heaviest to the lightest eggs in relation to those medium size. Again, it, it's getting out the double yolks and the real big ones, not sending in the little tiny ones. Those that fit in that normal range that we've always handled, we didn't see a big difference in, in that. Um, looking at the shape, like I said, the shape is what really determines why some eggs sit higher in the flat and lower. Um, if you got a very wide egg, it's gonna sit higher. If you've got a long narrow egg, it's gonna sit lower. In weighing these eggs, sometimes an egg that sits low might be the same weight as this one. It depends on the, on the shape of it. Well, how much did that have an effect? So we, we did another little study where we kind of created a, an index, an egg shape index, took the width of the egg, the length of the egg, and created a numerical score. Um, and assign that score to a number and then set eggs. And we can see a commercial flock here. This was a commercial flock, and this was the distribution within that flock. These would be the higher um, score here we assigned would be the more round eggs, and the really pointed eggs would be here. So again, our normal, and I have graph after graph after graph. Uh, we, we probably did um, you know 40 or more different flocks, and, and really they all follow the same trend, a normal distribution. We just really didn't see any that 
really fell out of that and showed us any different. So how much of a difference did we see in, in hatch from these? We did, we actually did see the normal shaped eggs, we would see a better hatch and hatch a fertile than the ones on the fringe. Now, this is, remember, this is um, following this curve here. So this group here is by far the vast majority of the eggs. These groups here are your next fringe. So this one is gonna be the vast majority of the eggs. This numerically as a percentage of hens that had, that would have been very low, but yes, we did have a slightly lower hatch on those that were outside of that normal range. So if we do get some big extremes where we start seeing a less uniform distribution of eggs, it can be a problem. We just didn't see that in a normal good producing flock and this was 40 some odd flocks, they all had that same um, bell-shaped curve that we would expect. So when we're looking at this, most hatchability problems are a result of poor fertility. We know that. However, um, when we get egg production, how we maintain those eggs and how we care for them will affect our hatchability. So again, it's back to the breeder farm. We've got to get good fertility. Most of our hatch problems are a result of poor fertility. Then when we get the good eggs, we need to handle them properly. So looking at a couple of practices, um, evaluating on-farm handling practices. And so in a hatchery themselves, and, and this is, presentation is not intended to give you things to go back and fix in your hatchery, but in your whole program. How often are the eggs collected? Particularly when we get extremes of temperature um, can make a big difference. Um, one, one customer was working with several years ago, Colin says, we had a really big drop in hatch. You know, um, this particular week, we had several days that our hatch was, was down, I mean, significantly down. And weather was good and everything. Well, when we back that up three and a half to four weeks when those eggs were coming off the, the chicken farm, we had some very sharp cold spell, and this was in Northwest Arkansas, very um, a drastic drop in temperature. Often, if you're a farmer, you're out there, well, there's not that many eggs. They're laid late in the day. We're not gonna go do our last pickup. And so they, they got chilled and we come back. Most of those were early dead. And most of those came when they tra traced it back to infrequent collection, particularly when the weather was harsh. If the weather is normal and stable, we won't see as big of an issue with it as far as temperature abuse. But the longer the eggs are left in the, in the house, more chance there is of them getting broken or, or defecated on or whatever. Um, when eggs are moved in the egg room, um, do there, are they there to stay? And they should be. We shouldn't pull a half a buggy out to reload it and push it back in. Are coal or bad eggs removed um, at the farm? And how is this done? I know one, one customer, this was many years ago, they had a really bad problem with the coal or bad eggs. They were just, the growers were just sending them in. I said, oh, we'll get more from them. We'll put them in the middle of the flats and buggies. You're not going to see them as much. More eggs, I get more money. And so they started set up a scoring system that says we're only going to allow X number of, you know, wrinkles or cracks or whatever. If it's beyond that, you can come in and regrade them. And if you do it a second time, we're going to regrade them for you and charge you. And once they improved that egg pack, the, they really had an improvement in their hatchability and quality because they had people trying to sand and wash and make them look like good eggs. Um, so egg gathering, how often are they gathered? Um, looking at our storage facilities um you know can they maintain temperature settings do the door seals properly when we saw a lot of um, problems like on farms with um, temperature fluctuations it wasn't so it wasn't as much the the uh, equipment they had in the, the heating or cooling system it was more of poorly insulated doors not sealing properly um, hot and cool spots in those machines where we didn't have air movement and the uniform um, temperature throughout so making sure there's not hot and cool spots, making sure your buggies and racks are not sitting right in front of a heater or, or unit, and then your air leaks, um, you know, all those can cause fluctuation. We saw some big fluctuations. We had people say, we don't have that. I'll well, send some data loggers out from the very beginning, send them out with those buggies and, and follow them all the way through. And one, remember one said, we don't have that problem. He had one farm that eggs coming from that farm, coming into the hatchery at eight degrees variance during the time they were laid, put in the buggy, they were probably pulled back out in the egg room, right, you know, and that's gonna, that's definitely cost you hatch. So, you know, moving the buggies in, um, into the coolers, leaving them there, avoiding hot and cool spots, don't place in farm racks in front, right in front of the coolers. 
Um, your egg pack quality, preparing and handling eggs, cleaning eggs has marginal benefits. And, and you know, I, I, most people say don't clean them. I know different companies say, well, you can flick off a, a adhering debris if you can get it off. Um, but uh, most part, we don't really want you cleaning them. Um, <clears throat> specific gravity, shell, shell color, egg shape, only the extremes reduced hatch from what we found. So if you have normal variation and you just don't like it, that's not really your problem. Um, so don't waste time blaming on those variables unless you've got some extremes, which most of the times we didn't see those extremes. We just saw normal variation. Again, the dirty eggs, um, like I said, sanding blocks. Some people say they're okay in moderation. Um, again, it's more flicking off the little debris. Spray bottles, wash rags, generally a no. The, the general rule of thumb's always been is you don't want hatching eggs. Generally rule of thumb. And I, and I will agree with that message we give to growers is don't wet hatching eggs. From a scientific standpoint, can you clean dirty eggs with by getting them wet? Yes, you can. Um, some of the equipment we have has done a very good job of sanitizing floor eggs even and, and cleaning that shell surface. Um, but a spray bottle, a wash rag, a dip bucket in there is not the answer. That's not going to do it because we, we have to control that temperature and, and most people um, don't do it unless we're dealing with some eggs a little bit more value, duck eggs or sometimes turkey eggs in the, in the broiler industry. We just don't, we just say don't do it. Um, and, and that's mostly because there's too many inherent potential problems if it's done not correctly. And so we just say don't do it. Remember in finishing up, you can have a great breeder program and a bad hatchery, but you cannot have a bad breeder program and a great hatchery. It, it just, it, it can't happen. They have to go side by side. And in my years in extension and working with different companies um, and different equipment, didn't matter what incubator uh, type, whether it's James Way, Chickmaster, whatever, didn't even matter the incubator type. The best hatcheries always were associated with a really good breeder program and they have to go hand in hand. Um, we have to set quality hatching eggs in our incubators before we can expect the best results. So all the things we talk about in other webinars and I encourage you to come and look at our other webinars. We, I get asked periodically about a, a topic and I said, oh, do you have access to that? Well, go to jamesway.com, go to our webinar page and there's like 50 maybe, and I can't remember the exact number at this point, of our recorded videos of our webinars and the PDF. You can download, you can watch over and over and over. So all, a lot of those things talk about our incubators themselves, but we have to have that quality hatching eggs to get the results regardless of what else we're doing. So with that, I think we'll entertain some questions. If there's questions you had that you didn't um, ask or you wanna ask later, you can go to webinars at jamesway.com and send those um, questions in and we can address them at that time. Um, and with that, I think we'll entertain some questions here, if there are any, David. We do have several, Dr. Bramwell. Thank you so much for this information. It's very, very valuable. Uh, we've got a lot of people who have interest and some questions. Let me take one moment to share my thoughts. If there are any young managers I out just there. knew you had to do this, David. You I'm sorry, to... Keith, I really, <laughs> I was trying not to. But if we've okay. got young managers out there, let me encourage you to set up a weekly QC program for your egg pack. Uh, you, you cannot repair what's there, but you can report on it. Right. Grow a relationship with your breeder department. A lot of times these reviews can be done jointly so that objectivity is there, but you have to know what's coming into your hatcheries or you cannot uh, make improvements and get a better performance. And I, and I, and I like to, and I, I didn't, I didn't really show, like you said, a, a, a evaluation of your egg pack and, and recording of it. And I always recommend at any time is not just looking at it. Yeah, they look pretty good. I, I think like you said, periodically, we need to have a scoring. You need to pull some out and score them because what you say looks pretty good. If you look a year ago, well, yeah, I thought they were pretty good then too. But if you were able to generate some numbers and some data that you can have hardcore down, you know, your mind and opinion can change over time, but numbers don't. So, um, you know, generating that, and like David said, is having a review of that to make sure we've got good quality eggs coming in. Absolutely. First question we have is, what is the best way to control Pseudomonas in the hatchery? And I'm supposed to know that, huh? That's a well, sanitation I, thing. 
Anyway, we'll get back if we don't have a good answer for that. Let's talk about setting upside down and livability. You mentioned that not only is the loss marginal, but if you incorporate a Novajack, it gets to be tremendous. Correct. Uh, your, your thoughts still agree with that? A absolutely. absolutely. When, when we did these and when we were not doing an Ovojack, you know, we, I was surprised. And, you know, I've seen data that says, oh, 25% of them don't hatch when they're set upside down. Some of them are, you know, 40%, 50%. And ours was, it was 10 and 15% didn't hatch when they were set upside down, which surprised me. I thought that number would have been higher, but 10 to 15% is still, is still too many to lose when, when it's an easy fix to have them just set the right side up. However, when we throw an ovoject in there and we've got chicks that are completely upside down and that needle's poking through um, and hitting wherever on that chick, um, we're definitely gonna have more mortality because and, and we don't have to sell anymore. We don't have the right pocket. And so, so that number then is increased dramatically. And like I said, if you've got, if you've got two upside down eggs per 168 eggs in one of our flights, you think, well, two, that's not too bad. Well, two's, two's a chick. It's a one, a chick, maybe even more, a chicken half, less per basket. So, how many baskets are you running through in that day? And that that, that becomes a bigger number. And it, as a manager, you can observe an overject as it's taking place, and as you see the blood coming out of the egg, you know you've got a problem, and then can can drill back later and, and identify the numbers. And it's What's really the, and it's really the upside down because uh, you know well, I've sat there and watched uh, the Nova jet going and we're seeing a little bit of blood popping out of that hole, but the eggs are set right side up. I've been surprised that we've actually marked some of those and, and we said, oh, that, that chick's dead. Look at that blood. And then not necessarily, you know, if it's set right, you could get a little bit of blood coming out of there, but we still, you know, the, the chick does fine. It's when it's upside down and it's like going through its spine or, you know, something yeah. really dramatic. That's where we just lose them. Let, let that just be an indicator to go back and truly search your numbers. Right. What scale, color scale are you using, Dr. Bramwell, was the question. Well, we, we just, we used, uh, what we used was just a, a, a handheld colorimeter that we kind of used that were assigned a score to that. I, I was talking with um, another consultant a while ago and they had one, not a consultant, it was one of our customers actually, that they went and bought one that was used for, I, I can't remember, crafts or something, I don't know. But, but it's really, it's, it's important to get a, a um, value back so you can put them in this bell-shaped curve. Now, does it tell me like an 80 is the number 80, is that too wide or not? No, that was giving us a range in there. And then from that, we created, you know, that bell-shaped curve. But like I said, when we created that bell-shaped curve and what we did is we took every egg and gave it a number score in our scoring system, it might be different with a different colorimeter. That's why I don't really want to give you a number because a different colorimeter would have a different number. But when we had that bell-shaped curve and we gave everybody a score on that and set those eggs, that's where we created that hatch that just kind of fit with that. So we only saw problems in the outside range. So it, it, there's a lot of different ways to do that. I know when I was talking with um, somebody the other day, they got one, I think, for use for crafts or something, a colorimeter. Well, their, their numbers were very different than ours, but you're still measuring the same thing and getting comparative to each other. So. And we talked about specific gravity. One of the questions is, is the shell strength related to mineral content of the feed, or is this a breed breeder related issue? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a breed strain issue. It's definitely related to your nutrition for sure. Um, I mean, a hen can only put the components in that shell that's needed if she has them in the diet. Obviously, um, as they age, you know, we get thinner shells because they're trying to put a shell over a larger egg with a larger yolk more albumin. So that's really uh, some of the studies I've read is you actually have the same um, shell components in an old and a larger egg as a smaller egg. It's just over a larger egg, so it's stretched thinner. Um, and so the diet definitely has a, a, a role in that. Um, but having said that, if your diets get really far off, we're going to see losses in egg production, but we can have diets that are just lacking enough minerals that you have poor shell quality that needs to be addressed. Specific gravity is one of the methods to measure that shell quality. And it's a pretty good one. And, and we've done that in a number of hatcheries. I know some hatcheries do it pretty routinely and, and not, but it's a pretty good measure, but there are, it's not the only way to measure that. What are your thoughts related to humidity control in maintaining a good egg pack? Do you see any correlation there? 
not not so much um, outside of our normal range. For instance, if you're if you're storing eggs and and you say, well, my humidity in my egg room is um, 60 percent. Is 70% going to affect that embryo? Well, that embryo is bathed in fluid, remember? Right. <laughs> the, embryo, the embryo doesn't know what the humidity is. That is just a, a factor of how much moisture loss you may lose from that pack. So if you're in a cool temperature and you've got 50 to 60, are we going to, different, are we going to see a difference in our, our moisture loss? We may, depending on how long they're there. But at that cooler temperature and that small range, and if they're there four or five days, we're not going to see in effect, I, and again, it's like keeping it within that range, but I wouldn't get hung up over my humidity is 3% lower than it used to be in your egg storage. Um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, doesn't have a real dramatic effect like temperature does. Temperature definitely does. And Keith, what are, what is the criteria to make? Uh, this, this question comes up with several people. How do you determine the dirty egg is bad enough to be cold? or can it be placed in hatch? What would you use for that purposes? And what about blood staining on the sale, on the shells? What's your thoughts on that? Well, the, the blood, first of all, the blood staining, what, what the potential that it can cause is we could clog some of your pores, it could affect your moisture loss. Um, you know, we don't, you know, if they're completely covered in blood, um, you know, you've had a, a, an issue blow a prolapse or whatever as a hen was laying an egg you know, you probably wouldn't want to set those. And that's typically what we see when we see a lot of blood is prolapse. We probably don't want to because we're going to have some effects on um, clogging up the pores. The, the other, as far as dirty eggs, I mean, I go by the, the rules is if you look at that egg and you've got a little stain on it, but there's no, there's no um, like a 3D structure off of that shell. You know, there's no fecal material. It's a small stain. Don't try and sand it off and clean it off. Just let it ride if it's a small little bit. Now, any adhering structures, if you can flick them off and clean them off with a block or whatever. I know some people use a little knife and just you can pop it off with a knife, you're good. Um, I would go along those lines. I, I We can't have eggs that don't have any spots on them. You right. know, it's just kind of the range that you're willing to accept. But definitely if it's a 3D structure, get it off, um, knock it off. And if the stain is too big, then that's one of the potential things we could have is you, you've got a bigger load of potential bacteria, but you also could be clogging pores. So. And, and let's address real quickly, what are your thoughts on filling a farm rack, particularly a farm rack that you're not going to complete that day mm -hmm. and have to revisit? What would you do to have the least amount of negative impact to the embryos? Well, I'd, lo I'd load the eggs. If you know you're not going to fill it, I'd load it from the obviously from the bottom up because we don't want to make it top heavy if we're not going to fill it. So load the bottom up. If you push that buggy in at the end of the day, the next day when you start gathering eggs, start on a new buggy. Don't pull that one back out in the workroom. Start on a new buggy, and when you get those into that egg room, then slide those new um, flats onto the buggy to fill it from there again from the bottom up. Um, so, because the eggs that are in there, if you have a partial and you bring it out that next morning and you start working them, now you've just brought them to a warmer temperature, and they're going to sit at that for a period of time, however long it takes you to fill that. So, once a buggy goes in with partial eggs, leave it in there. And, and, you know, that yeah. lets us piggyback a little bit on the data loggers you were talking about. Obviously, if you use data loggers and you pulled that dolly in and out, you would definitely see a W graph rather than a V graph. Right. Talk real quickly and, about and let, me, let me go. Let me go back. Yeah, the data. OK, on the data loggers. One thing on the data loggers, and I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of these and following them through the system. And, and I know some people have had um, had issues. Hang on a second. I lost the light here. Um, some people have had issues with data logger, but we don't really know for sure when that was, you know, when this event happened. And, you know, you kind of need to know that. So, you know, this drop, where was it? Was it at the farm? Was it on the truck? You know, so you follow that through. But I'm not concerned on a data logger with, oh, my gosh, look at that temperature spiked for five minutes. Because, you know, it's going to. But when we did, we did some work trying to see how long it takes for the internal temperature of that egg to change. And... You know, if you've got eggs that are at um, 70 degrees and also oh my, it's 80 degrees all of a sudden, it's an hour or more before that internal temperature of that egg actually changes to that. So when I say I'm looking at the data loggers, don't lose your head over the temperature went up 10 degrees for five minutes, but went right down exactly where I was supposed to be. That's going to happen when you open a door and different things. It's the uh, what we see is often the day to night. 
you know, yeah. especially non-farm egg runners, we see the night and daytime temperature really fluctuate. Or you can see when they move to a truck and not just a spike of moving there, like, okay, that truck is keeping at a temperature that's warmer than the egg room throughout the, the trip, then that's an issue. So the data loggers are good. We just need to understand. Well, they actually will fit in an egg flat. So you can evaluate all phases of your operation from oh, trucking absolutely. to farm to hatchery. So they're absolutely. very good. Uh, any questions we don't address now, we will answer by email and get those back to you. One more quick thing, and then we'll close out. I know back in the late 70s, early 80s, and probably a lot of the people on the site don't, did, wasn't even live then, but a lot of research was done at the university level on egg packs, what impacts it? How does that egg pack negative impact chick quality? Is, is the university systems, academia, are they doing any research currently on this? Cause the, the higher yielding breeds certainly create issues in incubation with more heat it has to be an impact also on the uh, on the developing embryo even during fertilization. Any thoughts there, Dr. Bramwell? As far as what what's being done research wise? Yes. I, I mean, I'll I'll say in this, you know, having spent a long time in academia, I mean, you look at now. Uh, I mean, and certainly everything doesn't have to be done by in a dedicated poultry science department. But you look at our in our poultry science departments, um, active faculty that work in hatcheries I, I don't i don't know who they are anymore right you know and so where's the research coming from you know breeders is kind of is not as much but in hatcheries it's really that way and and so it, it's research that i think there's a lot of people that would do um but but it needs to have a, a push like i think we could go to some universities because some of that is a little bit cheaper research to do the effects of egg pack um do we have any people that that's their goal and focus right yeah there's a couple but it's just it's not a big focus i mean it's unfortunately we in the breeder and hatchery side we don't get a lot of mileage as much as we should out of university research because um it, it's too distant from food safety and that's the big issue yep. i mean a lot of money put into food safety and food quality and customer approval and appearance and it's like we're backed up a ways in these hatcheries and, and it's just not a big selling card for a lot of funding agencies. So uh, I think that's why some of some of the, the research coming out of universities has been reduced is, is the funding agencies. Um, they, they've got other other items they are looking at. And and I encourage people out here, if you're if you got an interest in that, if you have a local um, university or institution, not even a poultry science department, and you've got some interest. I, I, I always had students that were interested in doing projects like that. I did projects like that in conjunction with um, customers, but um, it's just, there's not enough. There's not enough done. I'll just leave there's it. There's not enough. And that's it's a valuable not tool enough. to young managers to have the resources backed by academia to, to defend your thoughts on these, on these yeah. issues. And, and I, and I think in some cases, you know, and, and the facilities, I think a lot of universities are, and I'm not picking on anyone, um, but but a lot of they're, they're just they're lacking the facilities we used to have, and right. so not only the personnel but the facilities. I mean, there's a, there's a drive towards where, um, you know, food safety, food quality, customer approval, and that's really the push. And so we don't have that. So there's some things. A lot of the research I uh, that I showed you, I did, even though I was at the university, I did it in in local hatcheries. Right. You know, I did it in the, with their um, help. We went in, we sorted eggs, we marked them, we tagged them, we ran them through their system, we came back. And and so one thing I would encourage if anybody out there really has some questions, I mean, I'd be willing to help in any way I can, but locally, if you get somebody that, that understands the science enough and research enough to remove the variables, that's, that's a big thing. Don't put, don't put eggs in where we're gonna put dirty eggs in this machine and clean eggs in that machine and see what happens, but the eggs came from different flocks right. or they're different, you know, you, you've muddied it up with too many variables, but sure. there's a lot of things that can be done and gathered and, and, I, and I really appreciated at the time when I was in the universities, even now working with hatchery managers like, hey, we wanna learn this stuff, what can we do? Absolutely. I, I wanna find out the whys and I'm really big on that as, you know, I wanna tell a customer not, this is what you should do. I want to tell them why you should do it because if you can get them to understand the why and the importance of it, there's more buy-in. Right. And then they're like, oh yeah, we really need to do that because, and, and so I, I think always gaining more knowledge and information on things that understand the whys we do things is invaluable. 
And you mentioned earlier that we have an extensive library of webinars that are available to managers for review online. Do we have a document that you would recommend for a, a manager to assess EGPAC on a regular basis to use in a reporting method upstream? And if we don't, can we develop one and put it out there for our customers? I, I, we can develop one. We haven't had one. I think that's something easy that, that we can do. Uh, I've been working with different companies. A lot of them have different um, um, requirements and agendas, but I think it's something that we can develop. Um, we can get something together and, and maybe even attach it to this. Um, right. This when you get this in the next day or two. Um, I, I don't have anything right now, but I think that's a tremendous thing because I think sometimes we don't really know what to do. But like I said, I you know, I, one, one customer I worked with years ago, and I really liked the approach they had with this, and they saw a really big impact because their egg pack was getting pretty bad, is they were directly holding their um, farm in the, in the hatchery, the breeder manager, live production manager were all bought in on this. It's like, if eggs come in, and they're not up to the standard we set, you're, you as a grower are coming in and fixing it and regrading them, and they don't have to come in very many times to regrade them and decide they're going to do it the first time at the farm. Because they don't want to do it anymore, and and they saw a big a big change in their egg pack because it was pretty bad. I remember seeing it, it was pretty bad. So we can put something together. Well, Dr. Bramble, thank you so much for the presentation today. We had a lot of people comment on how much they enjoyed it. It's always informative. These are things if you've been in the industry forever, you take for granted. But I can't emphasize how critical they are to running a successful hatchery. Uh, we appreciate your time today. Any anybody who registered for this will be receiving the packet with a PDF and the questions that we did not get to today, we will answer and get a reply back to you. This has been James Way's Webinar Wednesday. It's been our pleasure to present this information for your use. I want to take this time to wish a happy holiday to all of our customers around the globe. I know uh, we all deserve and enjoy time off, so please have a great holiday season.